And I think that that's probably the single biggest risk, not just to Ukraine, but to world peace. Uh, so imagine a situation where Donald Trump becomes president. He says, we're not going to support Ukraine anymore. Ukraine eventually falls. Russia takes Ukraine and they say, and they're, they're unsatisfied with their conquest and they want more, which they do, and they've said so. And they go into Poland. So then what do we do? So does Donald Trump say, okay, we're, Poland is our NATO ally. We have a duty, a, a treaty obligation to go in um, and fight against Russia? No. So he abandons NATO. And then what happens? Then all of a sudden we're back in, in like second world war time. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. And today we are catching up with Bill Browder. He is the founder and CEO of Hermitage Capital Management and was the largest foreign investor in Russia until 2005 when he was banned from the country for exposing corruption. He's currently campaigning to impose sanctions against corrupt individuals linked to the Putin regime and to free political activists imprisoned by it. Bill Browder, good to see you again. Thank you very much for joining us on Frontline. And one of those people you are fighting for is your friend, uh, Vladimir Karamurza, who's serving a 25-year jail sentence in Russia for treason. What did he do? He accused President Putin of being a war criminal and a murderer. Um, we're now hearing that he's been moved to a prison in Siberia. Do you know how he is? Not good. So first of all, <clears throat> um, let me, let's back up just for one second. He has the longest sentence of any political prisoner in Russia. Putin hates Vladimir Karamurza more than any other political prisoner because Vladimir, together with me, got the Magnitsky Act passed all over the world, which um, freezes the assets of Putin and his cronies. And Putin, of course, values money more than human life. Um, before they ever put him in jail, they tried to kill him. They tried to kill him twice with poison. And so at the moment, while he's uh, sitting there serving his 25-year sentence, um, he's suffering from the after effects of this poison. He has something called polyneuropathy, which means he can't feel his feet. Um, his left side of his body is going numb. And so, and he was in Moscow until very recently. Uh, and then now they've moved him to Omsk in Siberia, which is considered to be one of the most hellish uh, places to be uh, he's in a, a terrible uh, detention center, and um, he's suffering, no question about it. And so uh, the urgency of trying to free him has just become even more uh, high. How difficult is it to get information about him? Well, when he was in Moscow, his lawyer could visit him regularly. Um, his lawyer could then pass on messages from him or to him. And so we had a pretty good sense of how things were going um, in Moscow. In Siberia, it's a whole new ballgame. So first of all, he, we need to find a lawyer for him in Siberia. And then will they give the lawyer access? The moment that they put Vladimir uh, in prison, they, um, they immediately put him into a, quote, punishment cell. Um, and so when you're in a punishment cell, which is solitary confinement, um, you're not allowed to see anybody, including your lawyer. And that's one of the ways that they isolate prisoners. And that's the one, of the, one of the ways that they try to break down their uh, psychology. So how is your campaign progressing to have him freed? Well, um, we, we started this campaign. He was, uh, he was arrested in April of um, 2022. Um, so he's now been in jail for a year and a half. Uh, when we started the campaign, the first thing we said was that since he was responsible for the uh, Magnitsky Act, um, which imposes sanctions on human rights violators, then we should make sure that everybody who has a Magnitsky Act um, uh, sanctions those people who are persecuting Vladimir. And um, so we've been successful so far. Uh, uh, the UK, who is um, Vladimir is a British citizen, has sanctioned a number of people. The US has done the same thing, Canada, um, uh, the European Union. And so th this is, I mean, by sanctioning a bunch of judges and prosecutors, it's not gonna get him out of jail. But what it does do is, is it, um, it signals the importance of him as a political prisoner. and. Um, and the, the, the reason to do that is because if they see him as being an important political prisoner, they're less likely to kill him than if they thought he was an unimportant political prisoner. And U.S. lawmakers want the Biden administration to formally designate him a U.S. permanent resident so it can be claimed he was wrongly detained. How is that progressing? Well, um, so the U.S. has something called the Levinson Act. The Levinson Act was named after a man named Levinson who was, who was a U.S. government employee, disappeared in Iraq, uh, in Iran, uh, and nobody ever did anything for him. And so the family campaigned to create this piece of legislation, which 
which says that if you get this designation of being <clears throat> wrongly detained, then um, the US will use all of its resources um, to free you. And um, Vladimir satisfies all the conditions for this Levinson Act. Um, the US State Department has not given him this designation yet. And so there's a piece of legislation that's been introduced um, uh, called the Vladimir Karamurza Freedom Act, which um, uh, demands that the um, State Department gives him this designation. Um, I'm quite certain that there will be nobody voting against it because he's, Vladimir is the most beloved of all um, you know, Russian oppositionists out there, and he's really a true hero. And if he is given this designation, are you confident it would lead to his release? Well, I'm confident then the most powerful country in the world would use all of their power to try to fight to get him out. And the US has got a great track record in getting out prisoners. Uh, the, if you remember, um, Brittany Griner was released. Um, uh, she was the women's basketball player. Paul Recessa Bagina, who is the um, hero from Hotel Rwanda, was released from, from uh, political detention in Rwanda. And, um, and just recently, of course, there were the um, five Americans who were released from uh, Evan Prison in Iran through this same program. You, you were a bit disappointed, uh, or you expressed your disappointment last time we spoke about the, the UK reaction, and you wanted the UK, in the UK, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office to have a directorship role to deal with situations of hostage, state hostage taking. Are you making any progress with that? Well, so um, in the US, what we, we've seen what I would call the best practice in terms of dealing with state hostages. Mm. Um, they had this Levinson Act, and then as a result of the Levinson Act, they have a guy in the, uh, in the um, government who's the special envoy for hostage affairs. He's the ambassador for hostage affairs. And um, he's a former army ranger um, and he's a real fighter. And he goes around and figures out all the different places where there's pressure points. And his main job is to get the hostages out. In the UK, they don't have anyone with that role. And so what you have is, is a bunch of people, bureaucrats and civil servants all sitting at their desks, you know, doing their thing, um, but without any strong incentive to get a hostage out because you know, they're the consular person or they're the person dealing with uh, sanctions, but they're not the one trying to, to, trying to free a hostage. And so um, uh, the US or the UK, um, uh, there was a proposal here in the UK from the Foreign Affairs Committee to do exactly what the US has done. Uh, and and they ha they've refused to, the government has rejected that proposal, there's no no progress in that area. Okay, we'll keep an eye on that one. Um, so um, it was two weeks or around two weeks after the, the failed Yevgeny Prigozhin mutiny when we last spoke. And um, he seemed to get away with it at the time because he was still alive, the plane hadn't crashed. And you were saying um, that this was the most precarious time for, for Putin himself. Um, what do you think now? Well, so, so the, the, the reason why it was precarious for Putin was that- He hadn't punished him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There, there was, here was this guy who had basically done the unthinkable, which is, uh, you know, Vladimir Karamurza says some bad words about Putin on TV, he gets 25 years. Yevgeny Prigozhin um, organizes an armed rebellion with 8,000 soldiers and marches towards Moscow, and he got nothing. Mm -hmm. And the message that that sent of him getting nothing, of him w w waltzing around in Moscow unharmed, was that Putin is a weak man. Mm -hmm. And if Putin is a weak man, then other people are going to go after Putin. And, and so, that, that, that two months that was where he was sitting there, where Prigozhin was flying around, meeting African dictators, doing what he was doing, that every day that, uh, during those two months was a day that Putin was looking like a humiliated weakling. And so- um, It was Putin, an extraordinary moment in history, wasn't it? It was completely extraordinary. And so Putin needed something to do something to fix that. And, um, and of course, they, or, they organized the um, explosion on this aircraft. And, and they probably very well organized the person who was filming the plane as it was sort of tumbling down to the ground so that there was an image in everyone's mind in Russia that if you cross Putin, that if you challenge him, that you're gonna be in a plane that explodes or you're gonna be poisoned or you're gonna be something. And the fact, the fact that it took two months was, was pretty interesting that, that they allowed him to live for two months. And, uh, but, Maybe, but, was it a question that the decision had not been made what to do about it all and it's, it was procrastination. It was uh, seeing how things played out, that kind of thing. They were probably just looking for the right moment. <clears throat> and, um, but now Putin is firmly back where he needs to be. Of course, Putin's launched an investigation into all of this. Uh, 
who knows uh, what, what will come of that. Um, at the time, so it looked like we did, everyone was asking what's going to happen to the Wagner Group um, and how it promotes uh, Russia's interests in places like, like Africa. What have you seen since? Well, it, it's, it's a very good question. So the, the, if, if you look at a map of Africa, there are 17 countries where the dictator has hired Wagner mercenaries to um, protect them, kill opponents, and do all sorts of other military activities. And you can almost draw a line right up through Africa. I mean, it's, it's, it's the most amazing foreign policy that any country could, could export. I mean, it's evil foreign policy, but, but that Russia has an enormous amount of influence in Africa. Prigozhin was the head of Wagner, and he, and he was a, a key man in that organization. And so it's hard to say um, how these <clears throat> organizations of, of mercenaries are going to respond to new bosses, to people stepping in. There's a lot of money associated with, with all of these um, mercenary operations. Who's going to get that money? It's all stuff that, that you're never going to read about it in a newspaper. You're gonna, not even going to know about it in most places. Um, and I, I would suspect, my, my guess is that the whole thing gets a lot messier because you don't have this, you know, Prigozhin might have been an evil man, but he was an evil genius and he was in charge of this thing. And I suspect it's not going to be well managed um, and, and, and may be less effective for, for, the, uh, for the Russians now. And in the war in Ukraine itself, it, you get a feeling that the momentum is picking up for Ukraine with its repeated attacks on Crimea and Russia's military facilities there, coupled with, with breaking through the lines of defense on the battlefield. And we're hearing now that the, the head of the Black Sea Fleet is reported to have died in the latest attack on Crimea. And before that, the general who was uh, commanding in charge of uh, the Zaporizhia region. Um, do you think any of this is going to make a real difference in terms of support for President Putin, in terms of the psychological effect of people either in Russia or, or the military themselves? Well, Putin doesn't care. He, he's running a dictatorship. He doesn't care whether anyone supports him. He, he's a dictator. He dictates. He tells them to, to do this, do that, et cetera, or you die. That, that's, that's how dictatorships work. And so for Putin, um, even though the Ukrainians are making progress and it's sort of a slow, it's not an exponential progress, Putin can just continue to throw people and resources at this. He's running out of weapons. He invites North Korea to come and supply more weapons. Um, he is running out of people. He, he, he then does another conscription. Um, he, the soldiers are, there's not enough soldiers on the front line, and so he doesn't rotate them out. Uh, he doesn't care. 300,000 Russian men have died in this war. He doesn't care. And probably another 600,000 have been maimed from this war. And you, you talked before that an effective measure to end that war would actually be to hit him where it hurts, and that's financially. And you talked about the, the need to stop Russia exporting gas and oil. Any movement on that? Well, it's very interesting because, no, there hasn't been, but there's been movement on one area, which is Russian diamonds. So Russia exports very few things. They, rush, they export oil, gas, diamonds, and steel, etc. And um, the reason we can't... Um, uh, embargo their oil, or, or the reason, the, the argument for why we don't embargo their oil is that they supply 10% of the world's oil. If you take 10% off of the market, then the price goes through the roof, and then we have inflation, and that's terrible. Diamonds, we don't care about. <laughs> diamonds, it doesn't matter what the price of diamonds are, high, low, whatever. It's not, it's, it's not going to affect anyone's life. And all of a sudden, they're talking about doing the most, you know, sort of per, uh, hardcore um, embargo of diamonds. The G7 is putting, putting, in, putting this in place. India is a place that, that buys the diamonds. We're saying, don't buy the diamonds. Antwerp, don't buy the diamonds. And we'll probably stop the Russians from doing the diamonds. So it's, it's entirely possible to stop the export of one of these commodities. It's just a question of, you know, how much do we want to suck up our gut and tighten our belt and figure out, you know, how much pain are we willing to endure? Because if we don't embargo their oil, they sell our oil for dollars, they bring those dollars back, and they use them to pay for weapons to kill Ukrainians. And this thing will just carry on. And we're spending all this money supporting Ukrainians. Um, and at the same time, we're giving money Russia, money to Russia to, to uh, uh, kill Ukrainians. It's, it's, it's sort of an absurdity. How, how much could um, sanctioning the diamond market cost Russia? It's not a huge amount. It's like $3 billion. But $3 billion is better than zero. Uh, Russia is refusing, meanwhile, to revive the Black Sea grain deal. Can any incentive be found for them to change their course on this? Well, P Putin only knows one thing, which is um, blackmail. And, and this is a great way to blackmail the world, which is to um, uh, you know, forbid the export of, of grain, 
which pushes up the price of grain and wheat. Um, it causes starvation in certain countries. And, and, you, and it's very interesting because the, um, the head of the UN um, was caught writing a letter to um, the foreign minister of Russia, Lavrov, basically trying to cut a deal saying, if you just open up the, the uh, uh, grain routes, uh, we'll drop some sanctions. Um, it's just, I mean, that is black, pure blackmail. And, and, and the UN, who doesn't even have the ability to drop the sanctions, um, is, is buying into it, is, is being influenced by it. What about the, the idea of giving more support to the Ukrainian cargo ships that are transporting, that can actually navigate a route out along the Ukrainian coastal areas? Do you think that the, 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 the international business community should, should be providing more help, perhaps uh, providing insurance that's affordable for those kind of routes? Well, I think the, the international community, the governments should, should, you know, the military should supply the help and, and the government should supply the insurance. It's not, a, it's not one insurance company's job to like take a huge hit mm -hmm. if, if a Russian, uh, you know, if a Russian bomb uh, sinks a Ukrainian uh, wheat freighter. But, but I, I do think it's, it's, um, it's in the West's interest to make sure that these um, grain routes are open. And as an indirect result of Russia pulling out of the grain deal, uh, Poland is now frustrated with Ukraine for having used it as an alternative export route. It says it will stop supplying weapons to Ukraine. Um, what, what do you think? I mean, I was talking to someone last week who was suggesting that this actually plays very well to what Russia would want. And actually, they might have known that this would be uh, the result of, of what they're doing to interdict the, the transport of grain uh, from Ukraine. Um, how do you see it? Well, there's an election going on in Poland. I think the election is October 15th. Um, there's a lot of farmers in Poland. Mm -hmm. And all, because of the blocking of the blockade of the um, uh, exports on the water, they've got to push it over land. As a result of it being pushed over land, there's a lot more Ukrainian grain and wheat um, in Poland, which, what does it do? It pushes the price down. Farmers are suffering. There's an election coming up. So the, I, I don't, I mean, I think that of all the countries in the world, the Poles have the biggest interest in supplying uh, weapons uh, to Ukraine. And so whatever's going on looks to me like a very short-term election uh, cycle issue, then, then the Poles are not going to be there helping the Ukrainians in the medium term. It, it does look like, though, that, that Russia might try and exploit this um, to make a lot of noise uh, and perhaps um, look at uh, ways to undermine the alliance um, by provoking uh, issues within, internal issues within the, the various member countries. Um, how do you think NATO should sort of proof itself from that? Well, I mean, this is, this is, how, they, this is how Russia operates, and they, they've always operated this way. And by the way, th there's no innovation. They, they've been doing this for 100 years in all different, in all different respects. Um, uh, there's no way to, to proof yourself from that. I mean, there, there's an election going on in Slovakia. The, the Slovakian, the front runner in Slovakia um, is a guy who doesn't want to uh, have EU supply weapons uh, to Ukraine. There is an election going on in the United States, and Donald Trump doesn't want to supply weapons to Ukraine. And so there's all sorts of things going on all over the world, different people, different kinds of corruption, bribery, blackmail, or just bad ideas um, who are in different places. So far, it's not a huge movement, but it could be, who are saying, uh, we shouldn't financially support Ukraine anymore. And, and I think this is probably the biggest risk to this war. I mean, the Ukrainians can, can and are pushing the Russians back, but um, they can only do that if they have our um, military support, weapons and money. And um, if we were to cut that off, then the Russians would eventually win in Ukraine. And your friend, uh, Vladimir Karamuza, as you said, was instrumental in getting the Magnitsky Act passed in the US, your campaign to get these punitive sanctions against human rights violators and corrupt individuals um, linked to the Russian regime. Uh, have you managed to accelerate this since the war? Well, I think the war set this whole concept on fire. So um, it was like pulling teeth to get like a dozen people sanctioned. I mean, it was just an unbelievably difficult thing because most governments were afraid of Russia. They yeah. thought, we don't want to provoke them. Um, all of a sudden, unprovoked Russia uh, launches the, the biggest land invasion you know, since the Second World War. And so the, the amount of sanctions are probably a hundredfold since before the war started. And it all started with the template of Magnitsky. How many more oligarchs do you think you, you've managed to sanction as a result then? Well, at the moment, there are about 43 big oligarchs on the sanctions list. And there's 118 big oligarchs on the Forbes list. Mm -hmm. And so there's still quite a few oligarchs needing to be sanctioned. 
And how strong do you think the support for President Putin is from those oligarchs the longer the war goes on and the longer they feel the effect of those sanctions? Well, the, the, um, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> they all watch the Prigozhin plane um, okay. uh, going down and none, none of them, are, it, 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 it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm sure they're all hating Putin's guts privately, but um, they'll never say anything to each other or, or anything publicly because they, they, all, all, they have that image of that plane going down and they're all in their private planes not wanting to go down. Earlier this month, uh, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the U.S. will transfer assets confiscated from Russian oligarchs to Ukraine. He said they will go to Ukrainian veterans and those who have en enabled Putin's war of aggression and they should pay for it. Um, I'm guessing your response would be it's a start. Well, my, my, my big pitch right now is, is um, in addition to the oligarch money, there is about $350 billion of Russian central bank reserves frozen here in Europe, in the United States, and other countries. And at the same time as everybody is <clears throat> complaining and worrying about money going to Ukraine, there's an easy way to solve this problem, is to confiscate that $350 billion and hand it over to Ukraine right now um, for their defense. And then we don't have any of these issues about people saying, well, uh, why should we be paying for Ukraine when there is a crisis on the southern border as the MAGA wing of the Republican Party is saying right now in the United States. And so that's the easy answer is, is um, let's, let's let the Russians pay for their own invasion. And the people that, that, that worry about that, they say, well, that might be illegal to do that. That money does belong to somebody. You can't just take it. And I know your, your point of view is, well, why not? They, they've, they've invaded Ukraine. That's illegal in itself. Or is there a legal argument for doing that? Yeah. There so so, so, so the, there, there's two competing legal arguments. I don't want to bore your <laughs> listeners, but, 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 but there's two legal arguments. The, the first argument, on, on Russia's side is, is if the money is protected by what's called sovereign immunity. In the same way as you can't go grab their embassy in London, you can't, you're not supposed to be able to grab their money. And so they're saying we're protected by sovereign immunity. There's another law which says, it's called the law on, the international law on countermeasures, which says that if a country causes terrible damage unsolicited like Russia has, then you can make claims against that country using the law on countermeasures. Mm -hmm. And so if you were to do a legal analysis, the, there is every legal principle and tool available to confiscate that money. The reason why nobody wants to do it is, is not because it's not legal, is that everybody is timid. They say, we don't want to provoke Putin. Um, we, we, you know, we, don't, we don't want to escalate. Um, and this, for the same reasons that we, we didn't want to provide tanks, and then we're providing tanks. We didn't want to provide missiles. We're providing missiles. We don't, we don't want to give the, the Ukrainians the Russian money. We will give them the money. It just will take more time. Yeah, I remember you, you were you were railing against the appeasement politics which has presided over this, this these relations uh, with Russia. Um, with the presidential elections in, in the U.S. next year, everything's up for grabs. Everything's up for. I mean, it could go any way, couldn't it? It absolutely can, and I think that that's probably the single biggest risk, not just to Ukraine but to world peace. Uh, so imagine a situation where Donald Trump becomes president. He says we're not going to support Ukraine anymore. Ukraine eventually falls. Russia takes Ukraine, and they say, and they're they're unsatisfied with their conquests, and they want more, which they do, and they've said so, and they go into Poland. So then, what do we do? So does Donald Trump say, okay, we're, Poland is our NATO ally, we have a duty, a, a treaty obligation to go in um, and fight against Russia? No. So he abandons NATO, and then what happens? Then all of a sudden, we're back in in like Second World War time. I introduced you as someone who was once the biggest foreign investor in Russia. Um, how does the Russia you knew compare to today's? Well, back then it was hopeful. I, I was, I, I, we all thought that, that it was bad. At the end of the Soviet Union, there was chaos. The whole thing didn't make sense. But we thought that there was some trajectory from this horribleness, you know, horrible to bad to okay to good. That was, that was our hope. And, and for a brief period of time, it went from horrible to bad. But then it went back from bad to horrible, which is where we are right now. You must be very personally disappointed. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a heartbreak to watch what's going on. And of course, it's not just disappointing for what's happened in Russia, but now we see what's happened to the Ukrainians. I mean, it's just terrible what's, what they're experiencing. And you argue that when this war is over, or perhaps even right now you might think this, that there needs to be a reassessment of the West's attitudes towards Russia. Um, you say, put up the Iron Curtain again. Um, why and how would that work? Well, basically, what we should have done um, when Putin started doing all this nasty stuff 10, 15 years ago was just say no. And maybe we, you know, we were not going to go in and, and put troops on the ground, but 
but why should we allow them to like buy up our politicians here in London? Why should they be allowed to like um, buy all sorts of establishment institutions? Why should we be tiptoeing around saying we can't do anything because we're so economically dependent on them? We should basically say, no, you know, we're not gonna do business with you. And any move that you make across that border will be met with absolute fierce, overwhelming power. That, that's, that's how the Cold War worked, and that's why there wasn't, that's why it was a Cold War, not a hot war. Um, we got a hot war right now because of all this um, craven appeasement that's been going on for the last 22 years. You, you've been um, campaigning now for many years uh, for justice for your friends, but also to, to get rid of uh, the corruption that you see in Russia. What is success for you? Well, at this point, success is, is um, creating enough consequences um, in economic terms so that Putin can no longer afford to be at war with Ukraine. The war has got to end. This is the most horrifying, terrible thing that's happened in most of our lifetimes. And um, that's got to stop. And if that were to stop, and then we could sort of cauterize the, the damage that Russia is doing, that would be a good outcome. Bill Browder, it's been great talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. You've been watching Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. My thanks to our producers today, Louis Sykes and Morgan Burdick, and for you for watching. If you'd like to support us, you can subscribe now or you can listen to Times Radio for the latest news and in-depth analysis or go to thetimes.co.uk. For now, though, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.